This episode of the Modern Therapist Survival Guide is brought to you by Thryzer. Thryzer is a modern billing platform for private pay therapists. Their platform automatically gets clients reimbursed by their insurance after every session. Just by billing your clients through Thryzer, you can potentially save them hundreds every month with no extra work on your end. The best part is you don't have to give up your rates. They charge a standard 3% processing fee. Listen at the end of the episode for more information on a special offer from Thryzer. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy, and this is the podcast for therapists about ways that we can make the world better and improve mental health and... We are recording this during Minority Mental Health Month. We are publishing this just due to our production schedule here a month later, partially because Katie and I are always moving the conversation forward. We're not just limiting conversations to whatever month du jour is being recognized, (laughs) but we are so grateful to be joined today by Meta World Peace and a very publicly out there person as far as mental health, about the ways of improving things, and we're just very thankful for having you here today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Oh, we are so excited for this conversation, even just in the the brief conversation we've had to get ready for this this conversation. I'm just really excited to talk with you and to to kind of see your perspective on all of this, because you've been living this in a different way than we have. So the first question that we ask all of our guests is who are you and what are you putting out into the world? Well, I think like for the most part, I'm probably, I'm a father, um, a husband, and I would say a philanthropist, entrepreneur, putting out in the world to be your best self, you know, reach for the stars. You know, being, being a philanthropist and entrepreneur, it has, it t- it has a lot of tie-in. So you're obviously trying to make a difference. So I would say I'm trying to put out there to people to be be the best version of you and reach for the stars. You know, that's kind of that's kind of how I'm living my life right now. Most of us are probably going to know you from also your basketball career and uh just having been a fan myself and having seen you at various points throughout your career, I remember after, you know, NBA finals, you getting out and being, you know, grabbed off by the sideline and thanking your therapist afterwards for helping put you into a great position. Uh, You've always very publicly spoken about just kind of where you're at. And I know that that wasn't the start of your story. So for our listeners, maybe to help frame them a little bit, can you share a little bit about what your story has been? as it pertains to mental health. Yeah, I think uh, growing up in Queensbridge Project, we live in the biggest federal housing projects. And actually back when uh, they built Queensbridge, it was actually a lot of, you know, just, you know, a, a regular, just no Americans, that, you know, white Americans that was in our neighborhood back in Queensbridge, Long Island City, Queens. Then in the f- 20s, 30s, it changed and it became integrated. Then in about the 50s, it was being more dominant about just blacks in, in the neighborhood. You know, throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and it became a lot of like, then like Latinos started to come into the neighborhood. So it's the, the landscape changed. Now it's being gentrified. Now it's being more mixed in. So, but in between that time, it, you know, especially in the 80s when the crack epidemic hit the, the city, the, the country really, it changed a lot. We used to have a lot of great, I mean, the, the federal housing project was a project to uplift people, give people a start, but then it kind of changed. So there was like a lot of things going on in the neighborhood. You know, this is years and years and years of, you know, um, of just struggling in our neighborhood. So then you get a lot of people in our neighborhood that's like going through different things. So that was like the main thing, and that, that caused mental health um, from the uh, the crack epidemic. Really caused a lot of stress on families, separating, you know, the uh, the, the moms and the dads, uh, and then you know, get, then getting arrested for weed and different things like that. Now is made legal, and as we know. Uh, the same people that made the laws to arrest people that was doing that was selling marijuana or smoking are the same people that's making the laws to be able to sell marijuana publicly right now um, the same, which is like really amazing and the same people that's making money 
off marijuana because they, they, they're able to see uh, what's going to happen in the future. So they're able to give this information back to people who understand business that's sitting in these meetings, you know, uh, and they understand, okay, they're, they're about to release these licenses. They're about to make these uh, acceptable or whatever. But, but the ones that suffer are the ones that's in jail, which is people that's like my friends, right, that's still suffering. And if you, if you get arrested for marijuana, right, let's say, you, let's say you're 12 years old and you get put in a group home, if you miss out on two weeks of school, when you get back, your teacher is going to say, okay, you got to catch up. If you can't catch up, you're going to fail. You get left back, yeah. right? Then when you get left back, you become uneducated. Then you're more likely to commit a crime, right? And then you're talking about, you know, uh, then you're talking about that same person that's, you know, was in a group home or in, a, in, in jail or committing crimes. And, and, and now multiply that by a hundred or a thousand. I live in the biggest federal housing projects in America, in Queens. That's where I'm from. So now you got almost like a war zone, you know, at times, different times of the day. So that when I look at that perspective, you know, uh, on top of not having money, on top of not doing that, doing, you know, not having money to take care of your family and different things like that, you know, I think, um, you know, stress could be, uh, it, it could build over time, right? Because I remember as a kid having fun playing in the park. I didn't have money as a kid. I wasn't rich. But I remember not having to worry. I remember running around, playing tag, seeing my friends, asking mom, is there food on the table? Okay. I right, no food today. All right, cool. Just give me some water, some candy. Go back outside. Hey, friends, what are you doing? I remember those days, right? When it was fun, not fun being poor, but I wasn't worried. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. then you get older and then you got a, a whole other dynamic. Then you have to build a shell. Then you have to build a shell because you got to protect yourself out in those streets. You know, I'm, one kid asked me from Detroit. I was giving a, um, a, a lecture to these kids and he was like, what do I do if somebody's attacking my mom? Right? And they... W- if he attacks that person back, then he can go to jail, right? But what do you tell him? Don't protect your mom, you know? So it's like that whole dynamic where you learn behavior. It's like, you know, if you learn education or if you learn how to meditate and you like, and you like meditation, it's the same thing if you learn how to defend yourself every day for years. It's like practicing a jumper. It's like practicing your free throw. That free, the more you practice, the better you get, right? So the more you have these behaviors, you know, the better you get at, you know, stress and, and depression or it doesn't sound right, but it, it, it can build up like a snowball. It can have a snowball effect. So, you know, after when I, when I look at the whole dynamic and, and it took me, I'm 42 now. So it took me years and years to learn about the history because that helped me with my mental health, learning about history. And even like when you take it back, you know, African Americans came here as slaves, right? So when you take it back, when you was when we when we were separated from the boat, from our parents, so we came here. You know, when we came here to America, we didn't have our dad or mom. And I mean, actually, some of the kids was left back home, and the and the women, you know, they were split up. So with that being said, it's it's years and years and years of not having someone to really look up to. You're just looking up to the streets. You're, you're looking up to somebody who's stressed. You know, imagine coming home every day and you're asking for some advice, but that person is stressed, right? So that's, that's your environment. So now, now that I learned all that, because I did, I, did I did a ton of history because I was trying to learn by myself. When I did all that, that, that research and I was like, oh, wow, I really didn't have a shot. I really should have been in jail. I'll tell you the truth. All my friends, is in, a lot of my friends in jail, right? So, um, you know, a lot of my friends in jail, whether it's murder, whether it's drugs, whether it's violent crimes, whatever the case, whatever the case may be, right? So when I look at it like that, that makes me want to really um, attack mental health. Uh, now, chemical imbalance is different, right? Chemical imbalance, I have family that have chemical imbalances. My auntie, schizophrenic. My little brother, a psychiatric ward. My little sister, psychiatric wards. I, I got, and my, my other, one of my other aunties, on, you know, on medicine. My dad functional on medication. So that's a whole nother issue that I also want to address and help. I believe we need to support our, you know, our, 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 our friends and people that's on medication that, that's trying to re-enter into the world because it's really, it's really hard for them. You know, so I have two different dynamics. It's a, you know, it's a, um, it's a over time, things that build up. Then it's sometimes family, household situations, and then it's chemical, right? So now that I understand that, it makes me want to just like, just give back to the mental health community 
Um, and not just like, you know, not just my demographic, because we, we all go through different things. Mm-hmm. You know, all, all ethnicities are going through, through different things when it comes to mental health. Everybody, we're, we're all human, right? So everybody's going through their own thing, right? So, so, so how, do we, how do we get through that? And I think the best way to get through that is to understand your history, right? And don't beat yourself up, right? People, too many people's beating themselves up for things they can't control. What you're talking about is this just generational trauma, mm-hmm. personal trauma, and then also you kind of are leading into this like nature versus nurture thing mm-hmm. where some of this stuff is kind of you're predisposed, kind of quote unquote the chemical imbalance, but mm-hmm. also you compound that with what you're talking about with this these bro- broken systems. And to mm-hmm. me, it seems like it makes it really hard to feel hopeful. And it sounds like what you're saying is, I shouldn't be on the path that I'm on. This is yeah. surprising because of everything that I've gone through with all of the the stuff that's happened in my family. And and I guess for for me the question I have is how do you make sense of that? Cuz it sounds like you've been, you know, doing your history, understanding it and giving yourself a lot of compassion and grace for who you are and how you're showing up in the world. Mm-hmm. But you're also now taking that and wanting to give back to yeah. the community as a whole. But it, it just seems like there's so much to make sense of here. How do you do that? It is a lot to make sense of. That's a good question. And you you do it by, I don't really take notes on mental health mm-hmm. like I would do in a business. Sure. You know, like I'm doing on multiple businesses. I'm taking notes, got these documents, you know, hundreds of documents that I'm, that I'm managing. But on mental health, I don't do that, which is interesting you said that. That's so interesting <laughs> you just said that. That's so interesting because we should be documenting, you know, so you can actually, you know, speak education, so you can, so you can speak about it more uh, educationally, so you can understand sure. it more. I don't do that. It's just all in my head. Well, it makes a lot of <laughs> sense when you're talking about it. I guess, I guess the question really is, how do you get yourself to a place where you can give back? Because you're talking about lots and lots of trauma yeah, yeah, and yeah. lots and lots of struggle and, and hard work to get to where you are. Yeah. And instead of saying, okay, I'm good, I'm out, you're saying, oh, no, yeah. let me come back yeah. and, and, and help address this problem. I'm, one, I'm very competitive. And I think one of the things is I, I want to actually help solve this problem. Mm-hmm. I also, you know, I changed my name to Meta World Peace, which is, Meta was inspired by the, the Hindi culture, um, Buddhism, and then world peace was inspired by, you know, world peace. Yeah. Um, and I'm straight from the streets, you know, but, you know, and, and, and I'm competitive and I want to see it happen. You, know, you want to see it happen in your lifetime, not to say, okay, maybe sometime in the future yeah, yeah. we solve this problem. You're like, no, I want to see it in my lifetime. Yeah, I want to see it in my lifetime. And I, and I don't, you know, and then if you look on television, especially – um, back in the days, there was so much corrupt stuff going on, you know. Um, even with the even with po- some police, not every I love police, not every, my my best friends are cop. But even with like sometimes you'll see people, you know, police planting drugs on people. It's like so much stuff going on. Then you look at people that separate in the country, you know, people that trying to you know really separate black and white. We when it comes to race, we talk about black and white. We have other ethnicities out there, right? They're, they're not only are you separating, but you're causing drama because you're saying it's black and white. Mm-hmm. That's like the big term when it comes to race, mm-hmm. right? Black and white. But what about all the other ethnicities? What about people that get along? You know, we have to walk this earth together. And if I'm not mistaken, no matter what anybody does, we have to walk this earth together. You know, so with that being said, I love being around lots of people. I have all sorts of friends and I'm not going to let anyone tell me, you know, that it's not supposed to be like that. Right. So that's also stressful. You know, you'll get people that don't feel comfortable walking around each other, which is like, so it's like, you know, meta ultimate level of friendship, kindness, you know, um, which is opposite than how I felt a long time ago, but I felt how I felt because what I've, what I experienced. So it was like, just because I I experienced something, I'm not going to let it, uh, make me. I'm going to make me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> For the time period that you were describing growing up, mm-hmm. what was it like to first start to acknowledge some of the the things that you were identifying, the systemic things, the historical things, the chemical mm-hmm. imbalance things? This is 
largely been something that a lot of America hasn't embraced until really the last couple of years. But I'm guessing that, yeah. you know, in your neighborhood, that this was maybe not something that was talked about a whole lot. It was not. It was not. It was really, it was a, it's a struggle um, in our neighborhoods. And I'm pretty fearless when it comes to like my neighborhood and many different things. I remember my first album cover. It said on my album cover, it said no guns allowed. You know, I wanted to take on everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, no no drugs and no guns allowed in my neighborhood. You know, and I wanted to really do it and say you have to go through me, you know, in order to make and to come into my neighborhood because I've experienced so many things. You know, playing basketball, then you gotta duck under the bench, people shooting. Sometimes you gotta go to the game with with, with guns in your bag, you know, and different things like that to make sure everything's cool. And that's just not that's just not life. Life is tag. Life is freeze tag. Life is, you know, hopscotch when you're a child. You know, life is learning. You know, that's life. You know, life is, you know, kids should be outside playing, you know, uh, in parks. You know, in different I got dreams of putting even parks in rich neighborhoods. It's not even enough parks in rich neighborhoods. Everybody you got these big houses and you got all these kids living in the house. I I, I experience both sides, you know? And it's like, okay, at what point do we have somewhere where we can just go outside and just play? Because we're human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Is it, you know, we're human. And we have all these situations where rich kids commit suicide and different things like that. Yeah. We're human. It doesn't, <laughs> we can't get past the fact that we're human. There's nothing we could do, no matter how much money we have or no matter how poor you are. We're human, right? So that type of stuff is something that I feel like is solvable. Um, and at the, from the top down, Sometimes, you know, when you're at the top, you, 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 you disconnect. Money disconnects you from everything else. Yes, it does. At the top, you need to be more connected, more than any other time, because it's 7 billion people on the planet. You can't have 7 billion CEOs. We know this. <laughs> you can't have 7 billion CEOs. Very fair. That's a good point. <laughs> so if we know we can't have 7 billion CEOs and 7 billion billionaires, we got to make it comfortable. Yes. Right, we got to make it comfortable. We got to make people feel welcome in the, in this world. So you're talking prevention now, like you're really talking mm -hmm. about. Let's come together as human beings and let's let children play. Let's mm -hmm. let everybody be safe and feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. We know that that there's a lot of people who are spending a lot of money to make sure that's not true. <laughs> what do you say to them? I'd say it right now. I know I'm very <laughs> fearless, and sometimes um. I, I, I sometimes when I initially when I first started down this road, you know, I was um I wasn't able to get my message across the right way. Mm -hmm. It was more just like emotion. Yeah. Right? Sometimes I would do things according to how I felt, but you don't know how I feel. You just know what I did. Yes. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And now I'm able to talk about it. I, I actually took a years off of media because I'm also colorful. I, I'm also, you know, um <laughs> in the games and I like to do uh, fun stuff like I might you know uh, say something weird on television just because I want to have fun <laughs> you know um, and stuff like that and then I'm also very emotional when I play and a very passionate player right so you know so I'm not so I wasn't able to really communicate all the time how I feel and a lot of people's like that versus now I'm able to communicate how I feel so I do believe I mean I sit by myself a lot because right. I'm just into different things like tech. I was an architect major, math, two different dynamics, mm -hmm. you, know, in my, you know, from being in the streets to wanting to major in architecture. Not many people want to major in architecture or look at code. So I'm often home just by myself, right? So um, in order to keep that confidence going and not to get, um, not to get down, I need to feed myself <laughs> with confidence. Sure. Sometimes, so... I do believe I have some of the best solutions. <laughs> I do believe I have some of the best solutions. I, I, I could be these, wrong. I want to hear these solutions. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, I could be wrong, but I do believe I have the best solutions. <laughs> but it's true. Look at what I did when I said I want to thank my psychiatrist on national television when I won a championship. Mm -hmm. It's stuff like that that I think about because not everyone could afford $150 an hour for mental health services. Sure. And I've been thinking about this for a long time. You know, I'm like, how can I get marriage counseling, anger management counseling, and every, parenting, and whatever else, 
and feel better about myself, but someone else can't. Yeah. Right? So I'm always thinking about how can we help a mass group of people, you know, address issues and not feel like they have to hold it in. And I think it worked because when I did that, therapists was calling me. I didn't expect this, by the way. I did it for people. Yeah. I did not expect therapists to call me, Instagram, <laughs> LinkedIn, see me on the street. Thank you so much. My clients, they're way more open. I got more clients now. Oh, thank you. And then my own personal therapist, she didn't know I was going to say her name. <laughs> but I wanted to thank her, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's so interesting. This is 2010. I didn't even know she was a psychologist. I called her a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> I went on national TV. I said, I want to thank my psychiatrist. And she called me the next day. Meta, thank you for the um, compliment, but I'm your psychologist. I'm not your psychiatrist. I said, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> okay, well, let's figure out the difference there. <laughs> I saw you also uh, talk, and this was, I don't know, five or six years ago at mm -hmm. the SAMHSA Voice Awards. Yes. And I, I know that even within the professional athlete community, uh, Shamika Holdsclaw was yes. also speaking there. And grew up pretty much in the same neighborhood and mm. pointed to you even just as kind of a spotlight for her as, you know, somebody else to just kind of give that courage to. As you've had all of these kinds of moments throughout, you know, your career, and especially post-playing, um, how have you seen the responses to your messages about mental health really kind of change? It's great. I'm so happy because... If people know, people will call me crazy. People will call me crazy and they will call me a thug, mm. right? One, if you think I'm crazy, well, you might be right because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you might be right. If you see what I've been through, I'm not saying nobody else has been through it, but if you see what I've been through, you know, you might be right, you know, from the whole, um, you know, from the, from the, from the, from the parent situation. So I'm not gonna even go deep into it. You know, from the family situation, from the environment in this situation. You know, I had to grow a thick skull. You know, you, you know, it, it's not comfortable come, coming home and your friends are getting shot up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And happening multiple times. And I'm the connector where I live at. So I know everybody, right? And I'm cool with everybody. I bring people together. You know, versus separate, no matter how hard it hurts, you know, and, and I have that responsibility and sometimes it's big on my shoulders. You know, I'm trying to keep people from killing each other sometimes. You know, it's a whole different dynamic that people don't really understand. And then a thug, okay, you might be right. <laughs> you, might, you might be right. You know, every, all my friends, vet, thugs, and not all of them, but some, a lot of majority. You know, playing, you know, basketball playing thugs. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. One of my friends' mom was on, on, on drugs. A lot of my friends' parents was on drugs. Not a lot. I would say 30%. You know, which is very tough to deal with. You know, it's, it's a different dynamic. and It's a whole different dynamic. So I got a different perspective on life. You know, um, I don't like to judge people. No one. I don't like to judge people. If I see somebody have an issue... My, immediately, I'm like, what has that person been through when they were younger? The worst case scenario, because if I'm, I can't expect people to not judge me if I'm judging someone. So I'm always like trying to figure out like the backstory on people, because I, I believe everybody deserves a shot to be happy. Everybody deserves a shot to experience the other side of them. You know, I have family members that's been in the institution from the ages of eight till now and being 38, 40 years old. They never experienced, the, what, what is a 13-year-old experience? Yeah. What is a 21-year-old experience? They haven't experienced it. They only experienced the system. You know, so and I often refer to, uh, when I go to New York City, I always talk about the, the rats under the ground. They don't really want to live under the ground, but they have to because we don't want to see rats. But then you got pet rats around. That's pretty cool. They pet, but, you know, living in the jungle is not easy. You know, if you're living in people's always just trying to kill you. You're underground, no light, no sunlight, right? So even from that perspective, you know, uh, 
and, and, and having that open mind to really listen to someone's backstory, no matter who they are. You know, um, even the guy who threw the cup of beer at me in Detroit and pretty much derailed my career with me. You know, I reached out to him and we're cool. I wanted to know his backstory, even though I lost, you know, millions of dollars. But that wasn't important. You know, what's important was the backstory. Like, why did you do that? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who are you? Then I found out more about him. I'm like, oh, wow. I can see why he would do something like that, even though he was an a-hole. <laughs> <laughs> But I can see why he would do something like that. <laughs> and I think that's what people need to understand. You know, I think we get caught up in television, judge, judge people, ratings, whatever the case may be, opinions, critique, versus, oh, I wonder what that person was going through. You know, I think that's the that's what we and that's where we gotta get to. I think those kind of conversations are really interesting because oftentimes folks are so angry or they're so overwhelmed that they don't even think about the other person's backstory at all. They don't think about how do I get to a place of connection and, and all of the things that you're talking about, I hear so many different layers. I mm -hmm. hear we have to fix society. We have to fix the situation so that people are not living in these settings where there's this horrible, I don't even know the right word. A horrible environment. Just, yeah, just all mm -hmm. the trauma, all the yeah, trauma. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got, sure, yeah. you've got you've got those situations. You've got the the you've also got the the understanding that people are going through stuff, mm -hmm. and whether it's a horrible childhood, chemical imbalance, mm -hmm. whatever, what they've been trained to do, you're also looking at how do we come together. Mm -hmm. And so there's yeah. there's prevention, let's fix society. There's let's come together as human beings, which I think maybe actually is required to fix society. Yeah, it's for sure. And, and and it's it's opening conversations, not just about mental health, not just about substance abuse, but also about as a society how we take care of people. Yeah, you gotta take care of people. And got to. You you you've 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 teased these solutions that you have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm really curious about these solutions. Okay, what yeah. are your solutions? So I guess one of them, I think parenting is super important to me. I feel like I think we should be teaching parenting and partner and partnerships in schools. Because if you look at um the radio, where, where I learned how to treat women with disrespect at an early age. Mm. If you look at my neighborhood in Queens, which is a bunch of rappers, most the most rappers in one neighborhood in the in the world. <laughs> and we have the best in Nas. Nasty Nas. He has the best <laughs> artist in the world. <laughs> so we have it, which is incredible. He, you know, and when you look at it, when you listen, and now he's a he's a real, he's a real a realist rapper. Right? But I'm saying when you look at some of the other music that this that's that's being played, when I started to make music and I was in the NBA and I was trying to get stuff off my chest. Just naturally, I was dis disrespecting women. Mm. Not like say, I, not that I didn't like women, just the words that was coming out of my mouth. Sure, sure. Was not, you know. So I'm like, if we can learn that at a young age. And I remember when my son first started singing rap, he was 12 years old. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> at least wait till you're 15. <laughs> not at 12. You know, Give and, me a few more years before I have to have all these conversations with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I get the rap and I get the emotion. But some of it's un you un un subconsciously you're learning. So it's like, why don't we teach parenting? Why don't we teach a kid that when you get older, one day you're going to get married. And you you're going to go through something one day. And when it's adversity, you don't run away. Mm. Right? Like, this is real lessons. Because when you run away, what happens when you run away? You have a baby. You, get, you run away. You divorce. Your child is hurt. How many times is this happening in that world? struggling, every kid that experienced divorce is traumatized. Traumatized. Yep. It, 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 we don't talk about that part enough. So it's like, we, we have a big battle. It's a huge battle that is really, it's not hard to win, but we get distracted. We don't just keep fighting the battle. And we don't also agree on the solutions. Well, yeah. Well, the people that don't agree, we got to keep fighting the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Right, the people that don't agree with us, we gotta keep fighting the battle. And then even parenting, like you gotta give your kids, give give your children time. One day you're gonna be rich. When you become rich, you still need to give your your, your kid time because they don't care about the money; they care about the time. You know, so it's like stuff like that that I think could really affect mental health tremendously if we teach the importance on parenting and partnerships in schools. 
and I know that this is not just something that you're out there talking about, but you were really involved in your kids' lives. Recently, I wasn't always like that. I wasn't always like that. That's why I'm heavily involved now. I took off when I retired. People didn't understand. Hey, Meta, why don't you coach? Because when I had my first baby at 16, which I, I planned my baby too. So it wasn't an accident. I was 16 and me and my significant other, we wanted to have a baby. So we had a baby. And, but it was early. And every two years after that, so I was a teenager. I, I didn't even get to college yet. So I wanted to experience fun. So, and I did. Right. And, and, but then it became a habit. But I, I thought that when you make money, you just buy a house and you just like, you know, the, the, the wife is okay in the house. The kids is okay. And you just go party. And mm -hmm. I was young, you know, rightfully so. I was young. Um, but that's, it doesn't matter how young you are. That's not what they want. They want you. Yeah. They want you. Your wife doesn't want, she doesn't just only want money. She want you. You know, you gotta, and, and you gotta empower the wife. You know what I'm saying? You can't um, suppress the wife. Let the wife um, go. And, 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 and I didn't know that. It was things I didn't know. That's what I'm saying. It, it, I, I wish I would have known that stuff. And not that I taught myself, but I was like really trying to figure this out. Like, how can I become a better parent? And, and, and you know, I, I still struggle with certain things, but when I retired, I didn't want to do nothing else. I played for 18 years, pro. And I said, you know what? I'm staying home. I want to sit home, and that's it. And when I come home, my kids will see me, at least. So I did that over over the last, well, actually for the last like maybe ten years, trying to make up make up for time. You said that you kind of learned that. What, what what changed? How did you figure out that they wanted you versus the money you could offer them or the stability, the house? You know, I, I think it was just um, actions. You know, you can see you can you can see that. Your children are seeking attention, mm -hmm. and you start to be like, "Hold on, I gotta give them more time to my kids." <laughs> so that, and, and then by that time, you lost that other time. They know they, they know that <laughs> we lost time. Sure, it's not gonna just be you know uh, roses right away. You know, so you gotta try to figure out how to get that back. But how about prevent that? How about we prevent it mm -hmm. and teach kids like, "Hey, when you have your baby." Whether you're rich or whether you're working, same thing. Because say, say you're really rich and you're just really busy, right? You're traveling all over the world. What's the schedule for time for your children? Like what program do you have, you know, that's not just going on trips and buying presents? Or if you're a nine-to-five working person, you're busy too. You know, what schedule yeah. do you have, you know, with your children? And I think stuff like that, like we don't – if you don't know – you know, then you don't know. Well, and I think if you grow up in a, a situation where you don't have role models, you don't have examples, it's hard to know mm -hmm. what a healthy lifestyle can look like. It can be hard to know mm -hmm. what healthy relationships look like, what it means, what responsibility f to your family can look like, what they actually value in you. I mean, I'm hearing so many things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And that was one solution. <laughs> yeah, and that's only one solution. But it, That's but, my favorite one, actually. <laughs> but it seems to me that you're very comfortable telling your own story with a lot of humility to speaking to past mistakes or past knowledge you didn't have and how you come to that. And it seems like doing that in a very public way yeah. could be really hard. I mean, you talked about folks that called you crazy or a thug, but I think there's also this element of just being really vulnerable in public spaces. How do you take care of yourself when you're sharing I all know, of this? I know, I know. Because I see the mission. I see that you want to connect people. You want to make this something that, that we change and that we change in our lifetimes. But it, it's also, it's a lot of work on a day-to-day -day basis to be so out there and it's be true. so vulnerable with your own story. So true. So true. It's taxing on the brain. It's, it, it's really taxing because I, I, I really I really am making a difference. And like the other athletes and celebrities and Philanthropists, they making a difference also. Sure. I think I was early. Yes. You know, in terms of being vulnerable. Dennis Rodman was before me. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody listened to him early though. Dennis I Rodman don't think was we were ready. Yeah, I don't think people was ready. He was telling us his story on Oprah. And I don't think people was ready to be vulnerable with him and cry with him. He cried. <laughs> you know, and I don't think people was ready for that. And I think I was second. Um, it's not easy because sometimes people don't listen. I, I'll see, like, for example, there's a, there's a lot of different scenarios I have, but I'll, I'll do something and I'll see it being programmed on television 
and right and I was also trying to get my program on television. But because I have this other image, you know, they don't want to put me as an executive producer of something powerful. You know, I I turned out I turned down a lot of opportunities. Because people always you know, I'm a colorful. I I love comedy. I I like to do silly stuff. It's just fun to me, honestly. But then people want to put me on television on television to do something silly, but when I want to do something meaningful, they don't want to do that programming. Yeah. And they don't want me to be in a position to tell them how it should be. You know, as, as a producer, I'm a, you know, I'm a producer of, but I, so I tell my story on social media. I'll tell my story on news outlets. You know, so this is like an ongoing program and I use traditional media to tell the story for me. You know, um, and lately I've been just turning down opportunities because everybody say, hey, do this, uh, wear a funny hat. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm like, no, I want to, I want to do a program and, and help me build it. Because if I say I want to do a mental health program on a big network, okay, I'm not a producer. I'm, I'm a defender. I play defense. <laughs> right? you, you, you figure it out. Figure it out. I, may, I play defense and I make an impact. So, and I want to do something on big. You know, and I feel like everybody had their shot. And I feel like, you know, so from that perspective, that's why, and that's why I'm so vulnerable, honestly. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know how else I'm going to get it out to the, to the world. You're putting it all on the line. Sometimes it's too much. You know, sometimes I'm too vulnerable and it hurt me a lot because I'm telling people where I'm from. I tell people how I live. And sometimes, like, you know, corporations don't want to hear that on television, commercials, different things like that. Um, and I always wanted to be that guy. I always wanted to be that loving guy. Like, I always say, like, Tim Duncan. I love Tim Duncan. But he's just like, he's such a good guy. He's such a professional guy. I always wanted to be that guy. I made it to the pros, and I also wanted to do that also. But where I'm from, I had to say I wanted to stay relatable, and I felt like I was never going to be able to relate if I only portrayed that image. So I had to. Be, so that's why I was very vulnerable, and people actually got a chance to see who I was, which was a caring person, and 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 you know when they locked up 57 people from Queensbridge on Newsday in New York City. Everybody in New York know where I'm from. Mm-hmm. You know, they all know where I'm from. They all know I'm entrenched in that community, and but that should not that should not deter someone from doing stuff with me. You know, um, it should actually encourage them to do more stuff with me. With me, but from that perspective, I just feel like you know what? I'm, I'll just be vulnerable. I want people to know my story because right now, it's some kid going through that, white, black, Asian doesn't matter. It's some kid going through exactly what I've been through. That is not being heard. Our audience being mostly therapists, with all of your you know, publicity, all the projects that you're doing, mm-hmm. what is it that you wish that therapists knew better or understood to help kind of further along a lot of the things that you're trying to do here? I'm a big fan of therapists. I actually, we, we need more therapists, more therapists. We need more social workers. We need to pay them more. Honestly, and we I, we definitely gotta, agree with you on that one. <laughs> we do, I, I, we do. We need to pay our therapists more. We need more programming around there. We need, uh, we need our offices should be taking therapy lessons. Our firemen, our doctors, and they should be paid more, or paid to do a class, because you're going to come in contact with people. And then our offices, our let's talk about our offices and our firemen, and. I'm not biased towards any party. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm me. Mm-hmm. I'm not biased towards anything. But let's just let's look at it from from a from a different perspective now. They, you know, they have families also. Yes. But they're protect. But they're here to serve the public. They they're literally getting out their bed to serve the public. Some of them don't, but the majority of them do. There's there's good good and bad everywhere. It's, 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 it's more good than bad, honestly. But with that from that perspective. They should have free therapy, right? They should also ha- have some type of social worker license where you can communicate with people, right? You, you, you're walking amongst people that you don't even know. I can walk down the street right now, and I literally could blend in with anybody or talk to anybody, you know? That's, I've been doing this for a long time, like just like, you know, and I feel like that's super, impor- super important. And we also need to have more, um, we need to have more funding for therapy we need to have more funding so people can get into this field 
you know, uh, and different things like that. And I think from a therapist perspective, I feel like therapists are doing great. I mean, they got into this job for a reason. What, what else? I don't know what else to tell them, but keep doing, keep doing <laughs> amazing stuff. Um, I, I mean, some ther- I had one therapist that was it, it turned into a fan session. Oh no! Only one time though. Oh no! It never happened a lot, but one therapist is just like, to- I, it was just so funny. But <laughs> 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 but the majority of my therapists, I have a lot of them. I had a lot of them over thirty over my life. Probably yeah, over thirty over my life. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, for the most part, I feel like therapists just keep doing what you're doing. We need to we need to support. If anything, maybe be more of an activist. Oh, yeah, that's anything. that's yeah. exactly what we tell our therapists that yeah. are listening to the podcast is that if we can find ways to advocate and help sh- change the system, I mean, obviously, we'll benefit yeah, if we're yeah, able yeah. to do better work. But, I mean, the mission of what we do is helping people be their best selves, helping people to live better lives. Yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. it's something where, you know, a lot of therapists are told to kind of sit back in their offices and hide out. And we're like, no, no, no go no, out. Do it. Yeah, go, go out. Explore the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Well, speaking of going out, you have some projects and uh, how we're all getting involved here together. You've got a, an event coming up here in a couple of months. Yes, with Udify. Yeah. I'm so happy about Udify. Udify is one of the first companies that came to me mm-hmm. and really respected the, what, the, the, you know, the work that I've done in mental health in terms of a partnership. Sure. I mean, I mean, let's talk about making a difference, and let's also talk about economics. You know, therapists get paid, right? And you got we have all these new mental health platforms, and they come to me and say, "Oh man, I thank you. You changed the world." But you don't want me to be a part of your project. Mm. Udify actually came to me and was like, "Hey, we respect what you did, and we want you to be a part. We actually want to hear your thoughts." You know, I before I got into business, I was only doing therapy. And, you know, um, I was only thinking about philanthropy. Sorry, I was only thinking about philanthropy and helping people in the mental health space specifically. And that's all me and Heidi would talk about. Never business. The only reason we got into business is because like, we wasn't getting support. We needed money yeah. to continue this going. Because I was co- my first half of my career, I was coming out of pocket. I, mean, I can't keep coming out of pocket for, you know, to do good things. It's yeah. expensive. I can't help the world. No. You know, and, I, and I'm, 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 I'm at the forefront I'm way ahead of these corporations, some of them, in terms of mental health. So come just give me some money so I can give it back. <laughs> <laughs> I proved that when I, when I raffled off my championship ring, we raised $600,000, $671,000. Oh, wow. Hired a high school kid from Tennessee and said, figure out where to give this money to. And this is public news. It's not, you know, so so, so, so why, why, won't, why not support that? Why, why fight it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of the best. In sports, in sports at this, you know, so with that being said, Udify is incredible. We're going to do a golf event focused on mental health and we want to bring out the corporations, the influencers, hopefully some investors. And yeah, we want to build relationships, but we also want to center it around, you know, uh, just changing the narrative on mental health or being more supportive of the narrative. Because I do believe now we have a lot of, uh, I do believe there's a lot of great stories being told, a lot of great companies um, you see a lot of corporations getting involved now, which sure. is great. A lot of corporations getting involved in mental health, which I'm really happy about that. And, I, and I'm hoping with this Udify event that we're going to do, we can play some golf, have a good time, you know, and just like, you know, uh, and keep pushing it forward. Maybe just so our audience, we've we've been friends with Udify for a while, but maybe you can tell a little bit of what Udify actually is. Absolutely. <laughs> so Udify is a platform that, finds different services you know, for, for people that need help. What, you know, it can, is everybody's different, right? So some some people might need medication, some people might need might need therapy. Some people might need a different form of therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, cuz everybody's so different. Uh and Udify provides, you know, layers of different options, which I like because I don't want to pigeonhole anyone. I'm not really a I lean more towards psychology, but I'm not opposed to psychiatry, I'm not opposed to other methods you know um because i do uh, you know some people do have chemical imbalances and different things like that so with that being said i think udify is a is a platform that gives you options and and, and that makes me really happy you know yeah, yeah. well and, and they're also kind of in the tech space and you said that that's yeah. something that you're really interested in what got yeah, you, yeah, yeah. how'd you get interested in tech 
Tech is great. I, I think um, when I, my first major, I, I remember when I was going to college, I actually take it back. When I was in high school, I wasn't always a great student, mm -hmm. but I really love school. Mm -hmm. But I just couldn't pass my classes. Uh, and that's because I wasn't really, I didn't get the proper teaching as a kid. And I was, I was really stressed as a kid. Of course. Because <laughs> yeah. I was going through so much. When I got older, you know, I, I got into math. And, I, and my junior high school math teacher, he was um, very strict. No matter how much stress I came into class when I was 13, he will always keep it at math. He will always bring it back to math. You know, focus on your tests. And I remember it was a, a older white gentleman, heavy set white gentleman. Um, we had no relationship, but we had a math relationship. And it changed my life. You know, it made me feel like I could do something. Yeah. So and, and I and I thrived at it. I wasn't good at comprehension. So reading well, I was really bad at comprehension. I passed the SATs because of math. So then when I got, when I went to college, I said, you know what, I'm gonna major in architecture. I didn't I wasn't the best student, but I said I'm gonna push it. I'm, I'm competitive, and I, and I went to, um, so all my colleges that was recruiting me, I wanted to make sure they had architecture majors. Two of them did, three of them didn't. So the Notre Dame and Miami, I could have went to either one, which is an honor. I'm still honored to this day <laughs> that I was able to visit Notre Dame, and they, and, and they knew I wanted to be an architect, and I needed help, because I, I couldn't just go into it hot mm -hmm. and just be good student. Um, so then, then I went to the NBA. Years passed, retired, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I knew I wanted to be home, so I said, "I'm either get, I'm either rap full time, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm either be a coach full time, I'm gonna get my Series Seven, or I'm gonna do digital marketing." So I did rap for a while. I didn't want to be traveling and out late nights and being in the clubs and being with my children again, so I scratched that. Then coaching the same thing. I, I didn't want to be away from my children a lot. I wanted to be home, so I had to scratch coaching. Um, and then I studied for my Series 7. It was really difficult, so I wasn't prepared to go through it, so I just scratched that. And then digital marketing, I went back to UCLA for digital marketing, for social media, digital marketing. I did some coding classes. I went to Vancouver for, for a two-week Google, Google Analytics course. Um, I went to Concordia, Irvine's, and Irvine on Saturdays for business analytics, and I, and I wanted to see if I had the endurance. When I, when I, when I figured out I had the endurance and I loved it, and I knew I wasn't great when I started. This is like 2015 or something like that, 16. But I said, you know what? I still want to do it. And then it led to seven years later. <laughs> you know, I, I still have the endurance. <laughs> I do get tired, but I have the endurance. And now that led me to focusing on tech companies. You know, um, so I'm like, if anybody's in tech, I work AWS, GitHub, Apple developer, Firebase, uh, Google Analytics, um, Clavio, Airtable, literally all the all the tech platforms. Nice. Um, managing dev shops, um, and building other people's companies. Um, you know, I have I have quite a, a lot of female companies that I launched um in the healthcare space. Um that, you know, these females are, have opportunities to make tons of money um <laughs> if they company sells. <laughs> um so um but I didn't start that way, honestly. Yeah. I was very like green and my first pitch deck was actually a piece of paper. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I went into a big VC and I said, hey, um, this is what I'm doing and this is my pitch. <laughs> 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 so, you know, that's what, and then now it led me to being here, um, you know, with Udify and other tech companies. Yeah, and you, you make it sound like, and so the last 10 years I've been sitting at home with my kids. And <laughs> no, you've not been sitting. <laughs> I haven't been sitting, it's true. I haven't been sitting, I've been working. You've been working, but it sounds like <laughs> everything that you do has been very tied to really giving back, yes. giving opportunities, and, and really- and, and leading by example. And leading by example. Yeah, you, I, I try to embed philanthropy, because I was doing so much philanthropy, and I told my partner, Heidi, I said, Heidi, we're doing so much philanthropy, we're not making any revenue. Mm -hmm. Because all we want to do is philanthropy. So I was like, we got to figure this out. You know, so I said, and then, you know, years passed. We said, how about we embed philanthropy in everything we do? Oh, that's so smart. Where you can't break it. You can't break the code. Yeah. You know, so it's like, just give back and help people. <laughs> if I can help someone yeah. and, and, and they can do better, I mean, you know, job well done. It seems like there is kind of a special sauce that makes you you. 
And yet you also see how everyone should have an opportunity, have a chance. Not everybody can be a billionaire, yeah. not everybody can be a CEO, but but I just I'm really curious if you could either tell all the youth today what you think or go back in time and talk to your to your younger self. What do you think that that kids in the situation that you grew up in, or even in other situations yeah, yeah, that are challenging, like, what do they need to know? For one, I would say, just because I grew up in the streets doesn't mean I had the, 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 the biggest struggle. Mm -hmm. right? I think everybody goes through their own thing. Yeah. You know, I think the, I think, uh, identif I, I think trying to do history on yourself, like, do you understand yourself? Some people say, we don't understand, I don't, I don't know who I am. It's true. Yeah. You know, like, I really, it was a point in time, I didn't know who I was. Like, I don't know. I just don't know. But that's why I had to do history and try, you know, uh, especially it's, it's really hard for for black people or African-Americans because, you know, the history is like a lot of history is erased. So it's hard to like really pinpoint where your history, which is really important. But if you tr attempt to learn about yourself and your history, I think that's really important. No matter what ethnicity you are, it's really important that you understand your history and you understand who you are. You understand your family history. You know, I, I remember when I was doing my marriage counseling, that's where I learned a lot because my marriage counselor was saying, okay, we're going to get your mom, we're going to get your dad, and we're going to do therapy sessions together. I did therapy sessions with my family. Never did that before. Mm. And I found out things I didn't know. I found out that my mom and dad was having problems when I was in the belly mm. and before I was in the belly. And then it made sense. You know why I'm like this kid. They they say med they, they say medicine or Ronald Tess is so passionate. He's such a tough kid. Yeah, there's a reason why I'm so tough. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer not to be tough. Yeah. I prefer just to be talented. But 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 I had to be tough. You know what I'm saying? So from that perspective, now when I learn that, now I'm more vulnerable. I don't care. I don't mind telling people I have I see therapists or I cry during movies or I cry during tennis matches. <laughs> yeah, tennis tennis make me cry because it's so it's it's so um it's so in, inspiring inspiring. You see one person versus the other, and, and and they have so much passion. But it's like different things like that that you know now I'm, I feel comfortable and I feel like now I'm more empowered. You know, even though I'm six six and two fifty and <laughs> right now I'm three hundred, but <laughs> and one of the strongest small forwards to ever play the game of basketball. All that cool, but I'm still a human being. I can't get up and fly, <laughs> you know. I can't get up and fly. I can, I can, I can hold you scoreless. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that, but <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to be very thankful and respectful Thank for you. your time, and uh, give you an opportunity to let our audience know where they can follow you and all of the various projects that you're working on here. No, I really appreciate it. I mean, thank you so much because you know I'm definitely uh, appreciative of having an opportunity. But yeah, I think uh, for the most part, I have a company called Artest Management Group. I uh, had this concept in 2009 before I retired, and I wanted to build a management company um, and embed philanthropy versus only focus on philanthropy. Uh, and this way, I can generate revenue so I can continue to give back, so I can sustain what I want to do. So that was the that was the goal. So we just, just decided to strictly focus on business. And sometimes I'll tell people I'm not doing philanthropy no more because um, they caught me at the tail end and I got burnt out. Mm. So now I have Artist Management Group, which um, we launch companies, we help incubate companies. We have a company called Easy Care Link, which is uh, founded by a poor female lady from the Philippines, came here, became a nurse. She saw a problem that uh, in hospitals, it was a shortage of nurses. She's trying to solve it. Um, currently doing lots of money, uh, lots of money in revenue and building, and I'm really happy that I'm able to help her. I have another female founder uh, called is a company called Intrinsic, where we manage uh, athletes, uh, taxes, reconciliations, bill pay. Uh, we have big clients like Canelo Alvarez, who's one of the biggest boxers in the world. And I remember when she didn't have she was she was like a junior accountant, and I helped her launch her company. So I'm really excited about that company. We have Udify, which I'm a, one of my portfolio companies. Uh, we have um, X First X Sports, which is uh, my the company I'm really focused on, which is what I'm the, it's the only one I'm a CEO of. Okay. 
Everything else is just I'm just help out. But <laughs> <laughs> so you got to hear about this company then. It's, it's, it's a basketball company, mm -hmm. right? But we we focus on uh, giving creative. I'm sorry, we focus on competitive basketball experiences, um, and turning athletes, um, teams, and leagues into digital assets. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, so it's it's pretty cool, and our, our vision is to help athletes that was never able to get discovered before. Maybe you work at Starbucks. Maybe you work at Walgreens because you have to, but you're a really good, you're a talented player. We want to give you an opportunity to still compete, female, male. Also, we want to give you an opportunity to learn how to coach, general manage teams, own teams. So our platform is like an Uber for basketball. We want to take it global. We also want to give opportunities for ba basketball players to travel. You know, uh, so e even, even if you can't play basketball, maybe you want to be a coach. On our platform, you can learn. Maybe you maybe you you're the best coach in Encino. Oh, maybe somebody from the NBA recognizes you, or maybe somebody from a local college recognizes you. N never would have had an opportunity before to coach or general manage an NBA team, or even own an NBA team, or even work in the front office. And this is the whole experience when you talk about competitive basketball experiences. Competitive competition is not only players. Competition takes effort from everyone. Yeah. Um. So that's something that you know we're, that I'm really happy about. And once again, we're bringing people together. During COVID, we brought people together. And this, this is not a video game. This is actual in-person events, bringing people together around the world. That's amazing. We will include links to Meta's projects in our show notes. You can find those over at mtsgpodcast.com. Uh, follow us on our social media. We'll continue to share uh, the golf event that's being done with Udify and we're at this point planning on being out there ourselves. Yes. And continuing <laughs> to have this conversation, continuing to elevate all of the various stuff that continues to make our mental health system better. And until next time, I'm Kurt Waddell with Katie Renoy and Meta World Peace. Thanks again to our sponsor, Thryzer. Thryzer is a new billing platform for therapists that was built on the belief that therapy should be accessible and clinicians should earn what they are worth. Every time you bill a client through Thryzer, an insurance claim is automatically generated and sent directly to the client's insurance. From there, Thryzer provides concierge support to ensure clients get their reimbursement quickly and directly into their bank account. By eliminating reimbursement by check, confusion around benefits, and obscurity with reimbursement status, they allow your clients to focus on what actually matters rather than worrying about their money. It is very quick and easy to get set up, and it works great with EHR systems. Their team is super helpful and responsive, and the founder is actually a longtime therapy client who grew frustrated with his reimbursement times. Thryzer lets you become more accessible while remaining in complete control of your practice. Better experience for your clients during therapy means higher retention. Money won't be the reason they quit on therapy. Sign up using bit.ly forward slash modern therapists and use the code modern therapist if you want to test Thryzer completely risk free. You will get one month of no payment processing fees, meaning you earn 100% of your cash rate during that time. Once again, sign up at bit.ly forward slash modern therapists and use the code modern therapists if you want to test Thryzer completely risk free. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 